The Boy in the Alamo, Chapter 2, Off to the Alamo. That night, we had a rousing feast. Put the big pot in the little one. Colonel Crockett had a way with him, so that even Aunt Elvira perked up after he made such a fuss about the spare ribs and hominy and buttermilk biscuits she had cooked. She even got down the mustard grape jelly she saved for the preacher's visits. In spite of Uncle Todd and Aunt Elvira being so solemn about Buck leaving, Colonel Crockett had everybody laughing at his jokes and tales. That was a real spread, ma'am, Colonel Crockett said to Aunt Elvira when supper was over. Hunger makes good sauce, Aunt Elvira said, prim-like. That it does, Colonel Crockett answered. I don't mind the time I was riding with General Jackson and we got plum out of provisions. The men were so hungry they gnawed on acorns. There wasn't any game. Finally, I drew a bead on a little bitty squirrel. I wouldn't have looked at him any other time, but I shot him and he ran in a hole into the tree. I climbed that tree 30 feet up without a limb on it, pulled him out by the tail. The only person that was fidgeting was Buck. You could see he couldn't wait to get started. When we were going to bed, I said to Buck, please take me with you. But he said, no, very short. And he wouldn't look at me. I won't be any trouble to you, I said. This is man's business, said Buck. I don't want to hear any more about it. I lay down, but I couldn't sleep. I kept thinking about what I could do. They rode off before day, and there were six of them. Buck was there on his little buckskin pony. I didn't know whether I wanted to cry or say bad words. I just stood there, already lonesome. I would have followed them then, but I didn't have a horse. Just before they went out of sight, Buck turned around and waved at me. I'll see ya, he hollered. You will that. I swore under my breath. I already knew then what I was gonna do. The stagecoach came through Nacogdoches on Thursday, and it was Thursday. I meant to be on that stage. I didn't know how, but I meant to be on it. I wasn't even sure where the stage went, but I knew it went south. I felt bad about leaving Aunt Elvira and Uncle Todd. I spent the day laying in wood and kindling and doing chores so as to have everything ship shape as I could when I left. Usually, Aunt Elvira had to nag me to do things. I was always hanging around the forge instead of tending to chores, but that Thursday, I pinched into it. I guess she thought it was because I was missing Buck. That night, after everyone had gone to bed, I rolled up my things in a flower sack, and I wrote on a school slate that I had. Dear Aunt Elvira and Uncle Todd, I have gone to Bayar. Don't think hard of me. I signed it Billy because that's what she called me, even though I hated it for a baby name. Then I went out the door and started for the coaching inn. The stage stopped in Nacogdoches for supper. The horses were hitched to the railing when I got there and there was nobody about because it had begun to rain. I looked all over the coach for a place to hide, but there wasn't any. There wasn't even a spot I could hang on to in the back. The grips and trunks of the travelers were in a rack on the top and there was a little ladder that led up there. I climbed the ladder and scrounged myself between two leather trunks. I was tall for my age and there was not any room for me. But I shoved the trunks apart and worked myself under the rope and held on so that I wouldn't get thrown if we went around a curb. It was raining cold and there was a piece of dirty canvas over the trunks. I pulled that over me so you couldn't see me from the ground and I lay as still as I could. My heart was beating so hard that I thought it would shake the stage and maybe somebody would notice it. I don't know how long I waited for I went to sleep and what for what seemed like hours and I later woke up and I heard people. Three gentlemen got in the coach laughing and talking and the driver and his helper climbed up on the box and I could hear the jingling of the harness and the driver speaking to the horses. I was stiff from being so cramped. I was afraid to move a muscle though for fear somebody would know I was there. 
I stayed as still as a mouse, simile, hardly daring to breathe. All at once, the driver cracked his whip and the horses reared and plunged toward the road. I had to grab the handle of one of the trunks to keep from sliding off into space. The trunks jostled around a little and jammed into me. We went along for a fast clip and I could hear the shoes of the horses hitting the red gravelly road and see the sparks fly up and smell tobacco being smoked. The rain kept coming down and I was cold and wet. I thought of our cabin and the patchwork quilt on my bed and the lamp light and Aunt Elvira calling me Billy. And I thought, what am I doing here? But when I thought of Buck riding away without me that way, I gritted my teeth and held on. The road got rougher and we went into the dark pine woods and I can hear an old coyote howling. They make a lonesome sound like a woman crying, simile. I knew it was a coyote, but I didn't like to hear it wailing. Once an old gray timber wolf slunk across the side of the road and I could see his yellow eyes shining in the dark like lamps, simile. I saw a possum too. I had never been up so late at night, but I was wide awake. I was afraid if I went to sleep, I would fall off the stage. Also, I had to think what would happen in the morning if they should find me there. I didn't know what they might do with me riding for free without a buy your leave. I didn't know how I was going to eat either. I hadn't planned for that. I had brought along a dirk, a knife Buck had made for me for my birthday and my collection of rattles rattlesnake rattlers. I thought I might trade them for food. That was the longest night I ever remember. The rain stopped and the stars came out and the north wind whistled around for sonification. There wasn't a sound from inside the stage except once in a while a real loud snore. When we slowed down for some boggy ground and forded a little river, I inched up to the front edge of the roof and looked over. The driver was clucking to his horses and his partner was sitting by him with a shotgun over his knees. When we got over the creek, the partner took out his tobacco and rolled two cigarettes and they smoked. They were talking about the war in Texas. Could be that they went off half cocked, the driver said. Storm Bayard before everything was ready and now Dr. Grant and Colonel Johnson have run off with the army to Matamoros. Dr. Grant has it in his mind to get back his silver mines that the Mexicans captured. Looks like the Texian army couldn't be quite big enough to divide up yet. I hear General Houston is as mad as hops, the other man said. He thought he was commander in chief, but now it looks like several other people, including Colonel Fannin, are. I can't say I'd blame him, the driver said. An army has to have one boss and Houston is a good soldier. These Texians are all so high and mighty, the other fellow said. He had a lazy voice that came out slow and soft. They're all a bunch of spitfires. They're liable to make a hash out of this here war. I figure Santa Ana won't take this Bayard thing without rearing up on his hind legs. That made me mad. He wasn't a Texian for sure, or he wouldn't be talking that way. But it made me scared, too. They may find out they've got a wildcat by the tail they can't skin, he went on. There's just a handful at Bayar. Those Mexicans have got thousands. I wanted to lean over the edge and say, you wait until Davy Crockett gets there. But I held my tongue. I reckon you don't understand the real nature of our men, Oliver, the driver said. He sounded huffy. You can't figure a Texian like an ordinary fellow. Now you take James Bowie. He's from Louisiana, the helper said. Was, said the driver. He's a Texian now, and that knife of his has the strength of ten. Here, spell me at the reins. I'm going to take a siesta. I slid back between the trunks and lay there. My heart felt all mixed up. After a while, I guess I went to sleep myself because when I remember again, the sun was red in the sky. The stage had stopped jouncing and was standing still now. And the driver was standing on the ladder with his fur hat pushed back and looking at me. What in trunket? 
he said. I didn't say anything. I just looked at him and my teeth began to chatter. He started to untie the rope and take off one of the valises. We got a stowaway, he said to the gentleman who was standing on the ground. Youngin, where'd you come from, boy? Nacogdoches, I said. Where do you think you're going? I'm going to Bayar, I said, to find Buck. Who's Buck? Buck, that's my brother. He's one of Davy Crockett's volunteers. I couldn't help but feel proud when I said that. What's your name, the driver said. William Campbell, sir, I said. I aim to join the Texas Army. They all laughed. That really made me mad. I didn't see anything funny about it. Reckon they may need even you, the driver said. You gonna put me off, I asked, fearful. We were at a wide place in the road, and it was a road I never saw before. There was a log cabin over to one side with smoke coming out of the mud. At, with smoke coming out of the mud top chimney. The thought of a fire warmed me. I was about as frozen and stiff as a board from lying one way all night. Simply. I'll have to study the situation, the driver said. Please let me go on, I begged him. I've got a dirk knife. Buck made me, and I'll swap you for the fare. Stowaways are against the law. May have to put you in the calaboose when we come to one, the driver said. He was a big red-faced man, and everybody called him Murphy. Not until after breakfast, Murphy, <clears throat> one of the gentlemen from inside the stage said. He was a tall, good-looking man with a fine kind of face. Colonel William F. Gray of Virginia, at your service, sir, he said to me. Will you be my guest? I looked at him dumb. I didn't expect anybody to be kind to me. I'm powerful hungry, I said, much obliged. Courage always pleases me, I remember Colonel Gray said. Have you been up there all night? I told him I had. Well, my teeth are loose and I've been inside, Colonel Gray said. I see you're the, su the stuff soldiers are made of. I knew he was joshing me, but I felt better.